Okay, welcome to class. <laughs> the, uh, this class is Do You Think Christianly? And it's an exploration of the Christian worldview. And this is our first week. Uh, uh, what we are, are going to attempt to do is have about a half hour of teaching from 9.30 to 10. And then some discussion till 10.15. And we want to give people time to transition over to the other building for church. So we really, really, really need to be here at 9.30. Um, and I'll be here early, you know, come get your water and a find a seat. Um, so we, uh, the question, do you think Christian leaks? We are called to pursue a life of the mind. We are called to come to knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. In fact, Jesus answers the question about the greatest commandment. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. We have this admonition to maturity in, in Ephesians, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. I think we've all experienced this um, inability to stand firm and, and um, God wants us to be able to have a foundation to stand on. In fact, one of the things he's been speaking to me about here lately, you know, we, we know about building our house on the rock and building our house on the sand, and we sing the song, but it's really caught my attention. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the man whose house is built on the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. We all want to have a firm foundation built on the rock. And so we need to hear his words and we need to be committed to living by them. So, some particulars, why, why this class now? Well, in 2019-2020, uh, I completed the Colson Fellows Program, which is a 10-month worldview training from the Colson Center for a Christian Worldview. And one of the requirements of that class is to teach a worldview class or a worldview study, and that's what this is. Plus, I really care about teaching, and I enjoy it. I've been trying to reinvent myself in retirement, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, the Colson Center is uh, Chuck Colson's uh, ministry. Most people, if they're my age, know who he is. If not, um, he was one of the Watergate Seven. He was a special counsel to Richard Nixon, and they called him Nixon's hatchet man. And you can read his story in Born Again but he was saved prior to going to prison. And after leaving prison, he founded Prison Fellowship, which you may or may not heard of, but I'll bet you've heard of Angel Tree, mm -hmm. which is a ministry of Prison Fellowship that he started. It's a ministry that to give gifts to the children of incarcerated parents on behalf of the parent. And he wrote a lot of books back in the, over the last decades, a few of which I've read. And you also might be familiar with Breakpoint. So it's on the radio, if any of you listen to the radio anymore, rather than your XM, um, which is like a two minute, two or three minute uh, little radio program that he started and has continued now with uh, John Stone Street. He started World War Worldview training in 2005 with the Centurions program. You probably heard all this if you listen to Breakpoint and now it's the Colson Fellows Program because the two organizations were separated for organizational purposes after Chuck's death. But Chuck Colson believed that we were saved for something. 
and he worked tirelessly towards transformation of his world in light of the truth of Christianity. Some of the, these are the books that we read or that I'm using as resource for this. We read these three books in the Colson uh, Fellows Program, How Now Shall We Live is a book on worldview and making sense of your world, where is where a lot of this comparative worldview information was is gonna come from. But this other book, Why You Think the Way You Do, I think was probably my favorite book in the program, really is a history of Christian thought. So it starts with the early church and it really chronicles why the Middle Ages happened um, and the Enlightenment, all these things that happened that really have created the Western mind or the, the way that we think. I'm kind of a history buff anyway and I'm a big church history buff, so I really enjoyed this. There's these other two books that were not part of the program that I also have read or am reading. Probably the most famous worldview book is this book, The Universe Next Door. Um, so the question is, when I started the program, did I have a Christian worldview? Yes, I did. But what did I learn? Well, I learned better how to think within the context of Christianity, how to apply Christianity and biblical truths to the problems we encounter. One of the things is how we really function off of different dictionaries, depending on what your worldview is, and that those, those dictionaries have to be translated. I learned more about how to articulate Christianity, but more than anything, I was struck by the, f the same question that Chuck Colson had, what are we saved for? That we can be agents of change, that we can create pockets where we're partly setting things or returning things to the way that they're supposed to be. And we'll actually spend a lot of time of that after we kind of articulate the worldview um, and apply it to some things. So the trajectory of the class is that Today we're going to do some introductory remarks regarding worldview, and then we'll start into the definitions of the different worldviews, we'll compare and contrast them, we'll define the Christian worldview, and we'll talk about how we can discuss or articulate these ideas in light of the Christian worldview and apply them to the issues that we face. But as we go through this, it's really important, I think as believers always, to remember, especially when we're saying that we're right and everybody else is wrong, right? Um, that we really approach uh, the subject with humility. Uh, Peter reminds us, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Everyone has a worldview. Your worldview is a set of your basic beliefs about and for the world. It's the lens through which you see the world. And we're all familiar with those phrases like, she sees the world through rose-colored glasses. We all have, have a way through which we view the world. We all have a worldview, but it really comes from a variety of places. It, it doesn't develop systematically, but everybody is speaking from their worldview, and you'll hear snippets of these different sources of their worldview. It really is taught to us, it's caught, and it's thought. We get it from culture, media, and entertainment, right? This is a huge source of worldview for everyone. Um, our peers, and social media has become a huge driving force for worldview. And it's these powerful memes and these slogans and one-liners that really impact the way people think the world, view the world. We also get it from school. We're taught from a certain worldview perspective. And we get it from our home, the way our parents raised us. And all cultures tend to have a worldview that they would consider normal. And we might look at some cultures and say, well, that's really obvious, maybe in Middle Eastern countries. Because in the United States, we have all these worldviews and, and they're um, in conflict with one another. So your worldview, then, is it really just what you believe or is it what you do? So what you do really reveals what you believe. 
and our worldview determines our values, which informs our behavior. So you can find certain things about your beliefs and assumptions if you work backwards from your actions. Now that said, I think one of the huge worldview things of our day is this ability to compartmentalize and separate what we believe and what we do. And we'll talk about that in postmodernism and how that informs our worldviews. But worldview really is a matter of the heart. James Sire in his book, The Universe Next Door, defines the heart this way, because the Bible talks about that too. It's always talking about the heart and the mind, that in biblical terms, the heart is the central defining element of the human person. A worldview, therefore, is situated in the self, the central operating chamber of every human being. It is from this heart that all one's thoughts and actions proceed. I always think we can take Tim Keller's advice. And if you've read any Tim Keller, you know that he's always mm -hmm. telling you to look for your loves. Um, and he really equates loves and idolatry and worship. But the things that you love gives you a, a clue f of your worldviews. And Tim Keller always draws heavily on Augustine. This is, uh, if you've listened to Breakpoint, you've heard John Stone Street say this over and over again, that ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. And we can see that mm -hmm. in culture. Now, I think it's also another worldview um, thing that we can look at as when people look at bad ideas and victims, we might have a different idea about who the victims are. And that also comes from your worldview. But we, we see that these things play out in people's lives and it does not always end well. So then there's this question about worldview and religion and how do they relate. And I actually picked this off the crew website. And then this morning I was looking at like who's crew, you know, well, it's Campus Crusade for Christ. It's kind of their new name. Um, I've heard, you know, but anyway, not everyone has a religion. But everyone has a worldview which it acts exactly like a religion. And we, I mean, I think Christians make that point all the time. You know, they say, well, you don't, you know, you're religious, so, you know, your view doesn't count because it's religious. But everybody really has a way of thinking. Every worldview begins with assumptions that can only be taken by faith. Worldview assumptions are rarely acknowledged openly questions are challenged by those who hold them because it's, I mean, it's like, well, isn't that obvious to you? And that really comes out of your worldview. No worldview is totally open-minded. They all force some narrowing of thinking. And every worldview has strict and inflexible rules or absolutes that must never be broken. And that's... So what are the worldview assumptions? So. You know, every worldview has to answer certain things. And there's, you know, these books that kind of maybe um, categorize them a little different, but they also, they all have a view of origins. You know, where did we come from and what is the ultimate nature of reality? And they all deal with identity. What is a human being? What does it mean to be human? They all inform morality in some way. They have a view of what is right and wrong and where they come from, how you determine what is right and wrong or what it means to be good or to live a good life. They all address meaning. Is there meaning to life? What is that meaning? What is my purpose? Is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Or, and ultimately, what happens when I die? And that list comes from Making Sense of Your World uh, by Phillips Brown and Stone Street. Now, this is the other list from uh, World of Difference. Um, and he, uh, he does a really good job because he's got all the worldviews and then he kind of answers those in a chart. But, you know, there's this issue of theology, which is kind of like the idea of reality is, is there a God? Who and what is God? Is there a, a view of reality? Uh, there's a bunch of really, um, really big words in this list. So if your head's going to explode, it's going to happen <laughs> now. Um, the next one, yeah. 
So there's a view of reality is, you know, what's real and what's not real or is anything real. There's a epistemology or theory of knowledge. And, and I know you think now my head's exploding, but you know, there's real conversations that have gone on since Plato and Aristotle. What can we know and how do we know it? Could, do we only know things by based on what we can touch and measure empirically, or do we have other ways of knowing? There's a study of values. Is there a right and wrong? And what it does it mean to be human? What is a human being? And how are we related to the rest of the world? And history. What does history mean? Who gets to tell the story? Where is it going? And and this is playing out in in very real ways right now in the public square is is what does history mean and who who's who gets to tell the story so it is not uncommon to have elements from other worldviews infiltrate your worldview the western mind has developed over 2000 years and has gone through several transformations and I was thinking about this morning you know even people that would say they have a christian worldview you hear these little things come up like you know, I think a real, real common thing to hear people say, well, that's karma. Mm -hmm. That is not, you know, a Christian worldview component. And it's just not really a comparative religion class. So I don't know that we'll really define what, what really the theory of uh, what, what karma is, but it's not really, you know, quite how we do it. But but we, uh, you know, one of our problems is we live in a culture that increasingly thinks that all worldviews are equally valid, which by itself is a, a worldview question. Uh, but you can see that they come to vastly different conclusions about all the deep questions that we have and how they inform our behavior. Um, and they're radically different. But ultimately, um, Peter reminds us, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You know, we have a hope. And the world needs that hope. Now, some people are going to accept it and some people are going to reject it. But we need to be able to tell people about the hope that we have in Christ. And ultimately, as we go through the worldview question, we'll, we'll see what that hope is. And hopefully we'll be able to um, to be able to articulate it. And I, you know, this is something that always resonates back with me. You know, it's like, well, you know, to whom else can we go? You know, you have the words of eternal life, and I have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, ultimately. Ultimately, I mean, there's all these things swirling in our world, but ultimately, you know, he's the only place that we have to place our hope. So, you know, our goal then is to impact culture with the gospel, um, because outrage is not really a strategy, which is also a Darn. John Stone Street <laughs> quote that he does all the time. John Stone Street is the head of the Colson Center, and you know you can find him on the internet saying a lot of things. But we want to impact culture Christianly because we think it is the way we and the world were designed to function. Therefore, it will be a healing process for the world. We want to bring reconciliation to the world. How does God restore a broken culture? You know, we are broken, but God can still use us. And so there's these four questions, and, and you know, we're going to really revisit those when we come to kind of some of the issues at the end of the class about cultural engagement. And we can look out into culture and we can ask these questions. What is good in our culture that we can promote, protect, and celebrate? What is missing in our culture that we can creatively contribute? What is evil in our culture that we can stop? 
and in what is broken in our culture that we can restore. And those will be some of those final applications that, that we'll do. And I stole those from John Stone Street too. But so ultimately we come to this question. Do I think Christianly? Do I, which worldview do I have? Does it conform with reality? Which by the way is a worldview statement. And is it the one that I ought to have? <clears throat> because Christianity is a personal relationship, but it's more than a personal relationship. It's personal piety or personal character, but it's more than personal character. It is discipleship and it is sound doctrine, but it is more than discipleship because it's a way of seeing and understanding all of reality. It uh, sees everything through the lens of scripture rather than culture or experience. It's a total life system. The world was made by him and belongs to him, and he rules over all. So you probably have a Christian worldview, and, but you might find that you have little snippets of these other worldviews. and that you might have some work to do, but we're all members of one another and we're committed to coming alongside each other and walking together as we endeavor uh, to put on Christ. So interestingly enough, I went out and I thought, you know, Barna, you can find he, you know, the Barna group, they, they poll everything, right? And, um, and we can probably find more than one worldview poll in there, but I just Googled on their website and there, I found this 2017, um, <coughs> article um, that shows that now these are Christians who consider their faith important important and attend church regularly so these are not what we would say are people that they say they're Christian because it's part of their you know but that only 17% of them have a Christian worldview um, notably only 61% agree with ideas rooted in the new spirituality 54% resonate with postmodernist views and we'll we'll define all those things eventually 36 percent accept ideas associated with marxism and 29 percent believe ideas based on secularism and we can see that we're in a clash of worldviews a violent clash of worldviews and it it just it just keeps doubling down. I mean, every time we think, you know, we, we can't get reoriented. Every time one thing happens, it just doubles down, and the next one, it just comes in waves after waves after waves. Uh, but, you know, this is not the first time. Um, the early church, they really faced culture very much like the culture that we live in now. Uh, Christianity has been in direct conflict with the world, with the thinking of the world, and Jesus told his disciples that this would be the way it is. But we are struggling in the public square over who gets, wins the war of ideas uh, on all these issues of morality, identity, economics, justice. Uh, but Christianity in itself is in a clash over worldviews. And this is my concern. We know that a lot are going to reject the faith. But what do we do when the faith rejects itself? And my concern is that we are in um, a deep, deep struggle f for the church itself. Jesus um, said this, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. And then we have Paul, um, his admonition in Romans, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are not the only evangelists out there, and this is part of the reason we need to be able to, to have an answer. Uh, there are New Age evangelists 
if you're familiar with Oprah and Deepak Chopra, there's yoga, transcendental meditation, and many of these things have just infiltrated things that we don't even consider to be religious. Mm -hmm. There are the naturalists. I looked this up. Nova PBS says that it's the most watched primetime science series in American television history with 5 million weekly viewers. And, you know, Nova is on sometimes in our household, but they don't have the same worldview. I mean, so they're not just giving you a view of the universe. They're giving you a worldview on how on how you should find meaning or how you should found your life based on that. Um, Bill Nye, the science guy, is out there really being um, very vocal about uh, being a naturalist. We also have relativists. Almost everybody is, you know, wants you to live your truth. Uh, Marxism is really a hot topic, but uh, right now, both economically and in the whole critical theory and the whole discussion of, uh, around in, uh, race, and we see Black Lives Matter as being one of the um, one of the loudest discussions in our public sphere. And then, you know, one of the things that really I came to understand reading that book, Why You Think the Way You Do, is the uh, impact of Fro the Freudian thought that, you know, if sexual autonomy is really the means to flourishing, and we can, we can see that voice, uh, we can hear that all the time. There are materialists, there are other monotheists like Islam and false Christianities that don't really uh, conform to the historical Christian theology. And then the thing we have now are all these stories about people deconverting, and they're very, very vocal and very public, of which Joshua Harris is probably the most famous one. And they are out there proclaiming their deconversions with the insinuation or even with the help that you should follow in their footsteps. And this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm real concerned about the church. <clears throat> so in, our, in terms of developing a Christian worldview, it really is a biblical worldview. How does the Bible explain and interpret my life and the world around me? Because the Christian worldview is a biblical view of the world and for the world. Everything is informed and instructed by the Bible. And that's, this is also a thing we're really finding ourselves struggling in the public sphere over really um, trying to defend the Bible. And that comes from that book, Making Sense of Your World. Um, but how we read scripture is important. That we really need to read it through God's eyes, not our experiences, our contemporary culture. Another way to think about that is that, you know, when we go to the Bible, we are supposed to read out of it what it means. But our temptation is to read our own understanding into it and find confirmation there. But we are all called to examine our basic view of life in the light of what God has made clear, and then live our lives accordingly. So, do you need training and worldview even if you think Christianly? Well, I think it's really helpful to understand other worldviews, to help interpret the ideas of others, and we need to learn to bridge worldviews and to respond to the assertions of others <clears throat> and to translate these dictionaries that you know don't define words the same the same way so um i just want us to pray this together okay um i just has personalized this verse so what's bracketed is sort of what i put in um so you just want to pray that with me as i have received christ jesus the lord so help me walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as I was taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes me captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Amen. Let it be so. 
So next week, we are going to define and compare worldviews. So we need to be ready to go at 9.30. Um, so if we can be here. <laughs> and then we want to try to, uh, you know, have some teaching time, be able to um, dismiss in time to transfer across to church.